Hello students. It's a pleasure to meet with you again. Been looking forward to this all day. Well, this is a lecture I'm recording from my History 151 G course, which would, I think I would have delivered this lecture on the 14th of April. So uh, I think you can have opportunities of viewing this whenever you would like. Well, we're moving on in modern history. We're talking about the 20th century. And remember, I make a big deal over that, that this is one of the most violent centuries. It's, it's pretty bad many, in many, many ways. If we want to understand a lot of what's going on, we need to look at some of the nations involved. I'm going to take the discussion now away from the Soviet Union. And now let's take a look at Germany during this time frame. I'm right here on the study guide. German problems are not unique. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, there are people that believe that there is a, uh, a challenging scenario. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of people believe that there's a curse on Germany. Many years ago, when I was young, I remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's very famous for the kinds of uh, things he did with civil rights, uh, trying to awaken the moral conscience of, an, of a country. He did a very good job in this respect. I remember in one of these speeches, however, he said that there's a curse on Germany, that Germany is just inherently evil. And uh, with all of my great amount of admiration and respect for Martin Luther King, in this case, I'm going to disagree somewhat. You see, it'd be very easy for us to sit here and say, oh, by the way, there are bad things that happen, terrible things that happen. And it's Germany's fault. Germany's a bad boy. Everything Germany did is bad. And to a certain extent, that is excusing everybody else, isn't it? Nobody else did anything bad. Uh, some historians have actually said that uh, we have to start looking at the evilness of Germany upon unification, which took place in 1871, when the various German states come together and create one nation. And from that time, from 1871 until 1945, Germany's the bad boy, and you have to watch her uh, worldwide. Well, the difficulty with that is there's other people doing odd things before this time frame. Let's look at France, for example. Can we say France had a bad reputation? In the 1850s, France got involved in fighting in North northern Italy to drive the Austrians out so the Italians would get unification. And in doing so, they won a reward, which is a few pieces of Italy which they got are now part of France. Um, in the 1860s, France also got involved in setting up a military dictatorship, a puppet regime in Mexico. Mexico has been independent from Spain for huh, hundreds of years before this time. Well, I shouldn't say that. About 50 years before this time frame. And as an independent country, what on earth right does France have to send over a military expedition and create a military dictatorship? This was actually only possible because the United States was out of the loop for a while because it was fighting a vicious civil war. However, at the end of the civil war, the U.S. forces were deployed on the border with Mexico to threaten France in Mexico that this is unacceptable. Then we go to the war, the, the Franco-Prussian War, because Germany won the war in 1870 and 71, we say it was to Germany's benefit. On the other hand, it was France that declared war on Germany, not Germany on France. There are other examples of people doing things perhaps they should not have been doing. Well, the German problems are not unique. If we examine the history of many nations, uh, there are aspects of many nations that are very embarrassing. I made a big deal about imperialism, about European countries and the United States going around the world and grabbing whatever piece of land they can in some cases, and in doing some pretty awful things in the process. Um, since this is a world civilization course, we can also look at Japan. Uh, Japan's doing some pretty bad things starting in the 1930s. 
Um, they take Manchuria in 1931, a few years before the Nazis have even come to power. So they're not the only bad boys in town. The problems of Germany are not unique. The problems of Germany, unfortunately, we see represented in various governments and various peoples throughout the world and going back in history a very long, very long time. Uh, I want to bring this a little bit closer to home. I want to mention a man by the name of Stanley Milgram. Stanley Milgram was an American sociologist. I believe that he was, I believe he taught at Yale University. We could check that out in one second here. And uh, in any event, he did a lot of his work in Connecticut, which is, as you know, is very much a part of the United States. And let's just see. Well, let's not waste time with it. Anyway, he's an American sociologist. And uh, look at his dates. Of course, he was young during the Second World War. But of course, he knew what was going on as far as the Holocaust was concerned and much of the brutality that the Germans foisted on other nation nations, including Poland and Russia. He tried to find out. Initially, his, his thesis was this. Let's see what's different about Germany. Let's see why the Germans uh, follow authority and why they're so brutal. The idea was he would set up his, his examination, set up his test case in the United States. He would run the United States as essentially the control group. And later on, he would take his experiments to other countries, including Germany, to see some see some of the differences. Um, I heard of these uh, experiments much earlier than the time frame we're discussing. See, so he prints this book in 1971. I've read it. It's a very interesting book, and I highly recommend it. As I explain his tests, his experiments to you, this will ring a bell to every one of you. Can we say of all the major sociological experiments, this is one in which it is most widely known what happened. What Milgram did is he did ran an ad in a newspaper. He'll come down, uh, we'll pay, I believe it was $5. Uh, early 1960s, well, $5 is worth a lot more then than it is now. I would hazard a guess, maybe guess that maybe a $5 bill in the 60s is probably worth maybe 20 or more now. So to give you an idea, uh, would I do a lot of work for 20? Well, I've been known to work for money before. Um, so any event, you're going to come down, you're going to get $5. These are just these are volunteers, these are people, you know, men, women. And all this might take a noon hour. It's not going to take too long. So I guess people have come down. Now, this the situation was this. He set up a situation to see how people will react when other people are being hurt. You see, what you do is this. Uh, you have a, a board in front of these people. I've seen a mock-up of actually what was done. And you have uh, dials there that essentially say, you're giving this person a, an electric shock. Now, actually, you're not. But the experimenter, the person doing this, doesn't know that. You have a person sometimes in other rooms, sometimes in other booths. You, uh, sometimes you can see them, sometimes you cannot. But you can hear them. And you have somebody, an authority figure. It's not a military man with military uniform, but often we think about authority figures when you go to a doctor's office. You see somebody in a white frock coat. It means he's a doctor. It means he has authority. You have somebody wearing something like this. And then you tell these people, we want to see how well these people react to these shocks. And there are on these dials such things as saying you know, dangerous, very dangerous, painful, those kind of things. And it goes from low to high. And the, uh, of course, these people aren't being hurt. They're stooges. They're acting like they're being hurt. So then we have got the guy in the coat, John and Jane Q. Public sitting there. You say, okay, give this guy a shock to see how he reacts. And sometimes people scream. As you turn this up, they scream louder. And there are times they say, you're killing me. Uh, one time they actually even uh, 
said, oh, this man in here, we're doing the tests on him. He, he's, got, uh, he's got a heart problem, but we're not going to worry about that. Uh, and there's sometimes these people would start giving me shocks and I'd go, um, should I be doing this? Oh, the the uh, man at the white front comes, oh, yes, you have to. Do, you have to. Go right ahead. Yeah. I go, okay. Before Milgram ran these experiences, he went to his college at the university. And he said, well, gentlemen, what would you think that uh, uh, how many people would actually give them the full dosage? And, of course, the various professors had different opinions. It was like 1%, very, very small percentage would actually do it. Even though people were screaming that, you, that they were killing them. It's extremely painful. It was something like 80% of the people coming in actually gave the full dose. When it was over, they didn't want these people to sleep badly that night. They would come out and show the man was not really being hurt and shake hands and that kind of thing. But it is remarkable at what level Americans, people not indifferent than you and me perhaps, that would actually, as a mechanism of responding to authority, would do things that are quite evil. This was so fascinating that Milgram actually took this and did variations on this, how close are you, and, and he didn't really take these actually to foreign countries. Later on, other experimenters did similar things and tried these in different nationalities, including Germany. They found out there wasn't an awful lot of difference between what American would do, other nationalities, including Germans. Is this a fair indication, therefore, to say? that under certain circumstances, under certain mechanisms of control, we have been taught within our culture to do what is expected of us to the point that we will do things that are evil, even if we are Americans and not Germans. So I'm looking at Germany not as something that is an aberration that we can simply dismiss. I'm trying to look at Germany as an example of the kinds of things that can happen, the kinds of things that can that can go astray, and as a warning to many other countries, including the United States, that we do have to be very careful about these kind of things. Well, how do we understand Germany? How do we understand Nazi Germany? Is it fair to say that Adolf Hitler, no Adolf Hitler, no Nazi Germany? Now, this is controversial. Some people say that if there was not Adolf Hitler, the German people would have invented him. I don't believe that. This man has such unique abilities that in reality it is hard to imagine anybody else would have done what he had, would have gotten the power that he got, for one thing, and have done what he did when he did get the power. Um, Hitler, very unfortunately, is a human being just like everybody else. In trying to follow many arguments, dealing with Hitler. There are in fact people that object to publishing photographs of Adolf Hitler as a small child. He's virtually a baby. Looks like he's barely old enough to sit up. People say in doing this you're making him too human. We want him to be something that's so evil. Well, unfortunately he was human. Um, extremely evil human being, but he was he was human. It would be very nice, some people say, well, it's an aberration. In fact, he was insane. If your definition of insanity is not knowing what you're doing or not knowing the consequence of what you're doing, Hitler is not insane. In fact, he was very sane. He knew what he was doing. There was no doubt in his mind what was going on. Not only did he know what he was doing, he delighted in it. I'll mention this again in a minute. Hitler spent four years on the Western Front during the First World War. He was wounded twice. He knew what death was like. He knew what destruction was like. He knew what human suffering was like from personal experience. He knew in starting war what he was doing to people. And he reveled in it. He enjoyed it. Uh, can we explain Adolf Hitler? 
Um, I'm really out on a limb as far as this is concerned because I'm either a psychologist or a sociologist. To get a better understanding, perhaps you want to talk to them. My understanding, however, is that uh, how do we explain almost any human being is very challenging. How do we explain uh, Albert Einstein? Uh, how do we explain a lot of other people? Well, that be becomes challenging. How do we explain them? Um, can we say, however, and let's use the issue of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was a PhD candidate. He's working for his doctor's degree in theoretical physics from the University of Zurich. He's working as a patent clerk in Bern, where he gets rid of his work in the first couple of hours. He's got the rest of the day, another six, seven hours, uh, to work on his theoretical physics. So this man in 1905 publishes several, several very important papers dealing with theoretical physics, including the, perhaps the most famous theorem of them all equals mc squared. Not every physicist creates what Albert Einstein did. Not every professor of physics did that. But where else would we look to find somebody who's capable of doing that? Let's look at Adolf Hitler. Is every abused child end up being a mass murdering killer? That's not true. But where else would you look to find them? I mean, there are people that will, that will say, and I've read this in books, Hitler is one of my interests, so I, I try to keep up a little bit with the bibliography on him. And in any event, uh, there are people that uh, have argued that he had this idyllic childhood. He was so happy. Well, do we have reason to believe that was not true? We have reason to believe from his own testimony as to what it was like. Of course, people say, well, he's a liar. Well, wait a minute. How interesting. How can we simply ignore the primary sources? and say, oh, by the way, I don't agree with them, so we will dismiss all of them. Um, he was arrested. He was uh, tried for re fomenting rebellion in 1923. He was sent to Landau Prison, supposed to serve five years, ended up serving something like seven months. At this time, he dictated a book to his followers. People came and saw him in his cell. It's not like he was in a dungeon with rats eating his toes. I mean, he was in a fairly nice place, almost like an apartment. And people came to see him, and he dictated his basic political philosophies. Um, this is a very good way of getting insight into his thought process. This book was published later in two volumes, and it was called Mein Kampf. Kampf is essentially like my struggle, my trial. Um, it is somewhat disjointed, a lot of it's political in nature, as I've mentioned. He talks about political ideas, talks about racial purity. Some of it is autobiographical. Many years ago, a German student came to see me, we had a little conversation. And we went over to the library and looked at a few books on Adolf Hitler. And in the library, they had a few copies of Mein Kampf, of course, in English translation. And she says, as a German, I'm not allowed to read that. Hmm. Well, I'm an American, I am allowed to read it. And oh my goodness, the insights you get into this evil man. Hitler wrote about, and these are direct quotes from the English translation. He talks about drunken beatings. His father was named Alois, and Alois was an SOB. He was a drunk, he was mean, he came home and beat the children. And he beat Hitler. Um, drunken beatings from his father. At age six, the pitiable, pitiable little boy, obviously referring to himself, suspects the existence of things which can fill even an adult with nothing but horror, severe abuse. He also talks about fighting and quarreling. Apparently his mother, whom he adored, he hated, he didn't. Well, he put it this way, I respected my father. I adored my mother. He did like his mother. Well, fighting and quarreling, we do believe that his mother would uh, try to defend him, to defend the children when uh, Eloise is coming home beating them. Drunk and brutal, Dad. I have seen this in hundreds of instances. A severely abused child. Once again, this does not explain him. There are many fine human beings 
who lead moral and decent lives, who become good fathers and good husbands and community leaders that were abused. On the other hand, where else would you find or expect to find somebody capable of such brutality? Okay, war veteran. Uh, he's an Austrian, but he sneaks over to Germany when the First World War breaks out. He joins a Bavarian regiment early in the war. Uh, in one of the early battles, we call it the First Battle of Ypres, the uh, Germans were advancing against the British, and uh, everybody in his section was either killed or wounded but him. A bullet clipped his tunic. It did not hit him in the flesh, so he was not wounded, though he was wounded later on the Western Front. I've always wondered about this. The fine young men that were killed, millions of them, good, decent human beings, would have made great contributions. Many of those men are killed, but they then get Hitler, who survived. It's too bad the sniper or the man with the machine gun, the artillery, or the guy shooting the artillery piece didn't adjust his size just a little bit. We have not had to face this human being. On the other hand, as far as we know, there might have been dozens of other people who were as evil as Hitler that were in fact killed in the war. Well, okay. Um, we start out with a person who's had some challenges. Oh, let me hazard to put this in here. Let me state this dramatically. I'm saying these things not because I want to have sympathy or give you sympathy for Adolf Hitler. I do not have sympathy for him. He was an evil human being. He chose to be evil. And we can look at excuses, but he still chose to be the human being that he was. Okay. Um, can we say veterans? This doesn't do you, do you much good as far as your psychology is concerned. Being involved in combat, that can damage even very well-oriented people psychologically. Well, at the end of the war, <clears throat> Hitler survives. And um, uh, he's still in the army for a brief period of time after the war. It's about 1919 where he's sent to investigate a new political party, and there's like nine or ten people there. And uh, he eventually joins them, and uh, he pushes everybody else out and becomes the leader of the Nazi party. What are the Nazis about? Nazi is actually short for National Socialist. Well, the Nazis, Nationalists, these are, these are patriots. You know, Germany needs to be great again. Germany has been pushed down because of the war. Let's get out. Let's wave our flags. Let's achieve the greatness of our nation again. A lot of people feel knocked down because of the First World War. Uh, they're defeated. They're, they have to pay these very high reparations. And it's nice to have somebody to enliven you, to say good things about you. It's racist. Uh, he doesn't like minorities, particularly Jews. There are the minorities he don't, doesn't like. Doesn't like gypsies. He views the Asians as inferior forms of human humanity. And also he looks very much down his nose at Africans. And so uh, if you're appealing to racists and bigots, and unfortunately every society has them, Germany has at least a share, if not more, uh, this is somewhat of a uh, of something that you can get a certain amount of appeal to. <clears throat> Doesn't work in all cases. We'll come back to that later. The economy, okay, economy. The uh, um, it has been said that the biggest single factor in who is elected in any given election, in this case we talk about a presidential election, that the economy is the biggest single factor. If the incumbent or the, or the party that's usually blamed for what had gone on before, if that the economy's bad, we're in a recession, unemployment's high, inflation's high, people do look to, to a certain extent for a change. And what they will tend to do is vote for an, the other party. This can be a very big factor in swaying votes on a national and sometimes on a state and local level. Uh, 
<clears throat> Hitler preaches of the good economy. Economy in Germany is not too good after the First World War. We will make it better. We will fix the economy. He likes full employment. He likes good wages. Another factor is propaganda. Propaganda has been around for a long time. Uh, we could pull up the some of the examples of World War I propaganda where the Western powers, the United States, Britain, France, will actually, uh, actually display the Germans as some kind of a beast. You know, these are this terrible enemy which we're fighting against. Uh, so prop he doesn't invent propaganda, but he's awfully good at it. Political speeches by most politicians' time frame in Germany were, were pr pretty dull. You, know, you grab a piece of paper, you send it in front of the press, in a relatively good monotone, and you read this thing. Um, Hitler actually took a bit of a lead from the comedians and the cabarets. Uh, can we say this low class culture? Yeah, you go to the pub, you get drunk, you, know, you take a few beers, and people get up making, well, good jokes, lewd comments, uh, gyrating around low-class humor, but they're demonstrative. They vary their tones of voice. They can get you very interested in literally the skill of their presentation. Taking this kind of lead, Hitler becomes one of the most effective speechers. He's awfully, awfully good at this. He knows how to in, in, get a, a, a group of people enthralled. Sometimes he will start out at a whisper. He's hard to understand. His voice will build up in crescendo. He's good at gestures. In fact, when he was lecturing, sometimes he would say he'd lose a couple of pounds. Maybe that was water weight. But nonetheless, he's obviously eating up a few calories. Um, he would speak to emotional ideas, racist economy. Of course, he's got good fodder in you in attacking the Treaty of Versailles, and Germany was treated very badly. There's a famous stab in the back, in, in which uh, Germany was not actually lost the war, even though they did. That there was somebody in the background, Jews and others, that did the wrong thing, and we would have won the war had it not been for that. Now, anybody reading the books at this time would know better, but emotionally, this works fairly well. He likes posters. He likes simple slogans. Uh, sometimes they say that if you take something as simple and you repeat it often enough, people start to believe it. Sometimes uncritically. Well, it must be true. I've heard it so many times. Um, I'm kind of a idiot box kid. We watched television a lot when I was kids. We watched hundreds of thousands of commercials by the time we were adults. Before this time frame, I don't really remember this as well, but they had a lot of radio commercials. And I can tell you right now with absolute complete authority that Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Do you know how many times I've heard that? They didn't stop advertising cigarettes on television, I believe, until 1972. I got decades of this. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Call for Philip Morris, another brand of cigarettes. We Tarrington smokers would rather fight than switch. These are in my brain. Boy, I'd like to have something better bouncing around inside of there. But can you see how slogans, I'm using a comparison advertising, but how slogans can make a great deal of difference in how people actually believe. Hitler, radio was coming on very strongly in the 1920s. And Hitler was actually not just using speeches, uh, but he also used radio highly effective as well, effectively as well. Um, I'm not going to say that the Germans and other nations, nations are unsophisticated at this time frame, but it is true that sometimes when a new technology is brought forward, you do have a tendency for people to give it greater credence than perhaps it should have. An example is television. Television came, made a big splash in the United States starting in the 1950s. Uh, an advertiser would advertise something that they would think would be perhaps something that only a few people would buy, like a, a new refrigerator. Only a small percentage of them would buy. But you get people watching these advertisements on TV, and a very large percentage of people would start buying the televisions. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Start buying refrigerators, or this kind of refrigerator. Later on, when people became a little bit more careful about that, uh, the impact of TV advertising wasn't strong. But when you're looking at radio, 
it when it's first splashed big in the 1920s. This is a means by which a lot of people started paying more attention and later on become, shall we say, a little bit more cynical about it. Okay. Well, he follows, Hitler follows the example of Mussolini. Mussolini uh, led a march on Rome where he has a group of people that wore brown shirts. They call them brown shirts. And Hitler has a group of people, the SA or Sicherheitsabteilung, that also wore brown shirts. This this salute, familiar with this? I'm glad you're not here because this is very evil to us. So there's nobody here who's going to punch my lights out for having done this. But actually, the Nazi salute is, is an old fascist salute coming from Italy. And the fascists actually got this from the Romans. This was a Roman salute. And remember, Mussolini is pushing for the recreation of the Roman Empire. Well, um, in 1923, Hitler is following, he thinks, the example of Mussolini. And he's going to stage a march on Berlin. It's going to start out in Munich. It's a long walk from Munich uh, to Berlin. He's going to get thousands of people. They're going to come and overthrow the government and put Hitler into power. Well, they've got to take the police force over. The police open fire. A few policemen are killed. Uh, many more Nazis are killed. Once again, it would have been nice had someone hit Hitler. Actually, one of the men dragged him to the ground, dislocating his shoulder. So he had to wear a cast for a while until this healed. Of course, this is unnecessary. A man has been four years on the Western Front. Does not have to be dragged, dragged to the ground when he's under fire. He knows what he has to do. He has to get down and get down very rapidly. Nonetheless, he does survive. He is tried for a crime. This is treason. People are killed. Shouldn't he not have been executed? It's almost like this happens. This kind of thing happens often enough that the German government isn't really paying an awful lot of attention. In his trial, Hitler actually intimidates the judge. I would, I, would, I would not recommend this if you ever brought up in front of a judge about a traffic violation or whatever. Do not try to intimidate the judge because he can retaliate. Hitler actually shouted the judge down. And when the judge gave sentence on Hitler, five years, it was like the judge was apologizing to him for having to do this. Of course, I've already mentioned he was released in about seven months. It didn't last very long. Well, um, he did dictate, I've already mentioned this, Mein Kampf. It was published in 1925, and nobody pays attention. There's, there's, there's no, it's not a wild bestseller or anything. Yeah, after Hitler comes to power, almost every German household after 1933 say, we better have a copy of this, and it better be laid out on a table so everybody can see it. So everybody comes by, they're not going to question the loyalty of Adolf Hitler. Does that mean they read it? Probably not. Have you been in homes where people have the Bible laying on, on the coffee table? Yeah, I've, yeah, sure I have. have. Have they actually read it? I don't know. Um, a lot of people have Bibles, because uh, I guess you're supposed to have a Bible. How many of them actually read it is, uh, is another question. It's probably the same thing with Mein Kampf. Initially, it's not a wild bestseller. The Germans don't care. A lot of bunch of garbage. Hitler doesn't really uh, make, make a big splash anywhere. The German economy starts to improve after 1924. It does quite well for the next five years. And people aren't terribly concerned about these radical people like Hitler, these right-wing groups. And then we have the stock market crash. It's in October 1929 in the United States. Economists are still actually debating at what level or what extent the stock market crash led to the Great Depression. However, we can really say the economies do start to decline, and sometimes they start declining more rapidly. There are a number of factors involved, interest rates, monetary supply. One that I think is actually worth mentioning is the Holly Smoot Tariff. The United States has a reputation going back many years in which they tend to say or want uh, other countries to pay for our taxes. Now, the biggest thing that Americans tax uh, before the amendment that was passed was in 1916, which says that you can now tax income. They're taxing liquor. Another way the United States got taxation 
was by imposts, uh, tariffs on goods that were transported, or, or shall I say, brought into the United States. You take you take what's happening here. You bring in the the goods, and uh, you put a price on that. They have to pay so much for the price for the to import this in. So the government now has this amount of money. One of the things that's not realized uh, very well at that time frame is this. Well, what happens if, if goods come into the United States and the price goes up? What happens to the goods in the United States? Well, they go up too, particularly in competing industries. You see, the price goes up. So you say, well, the foreigners, the foreign nations are actually paying for our government, paying our government expenses. But in reality, who's paying for it is Americans in higher prices. I digress. Americans have a tradition. We have a problem financially, and there is a problem financially. They need more money. Let's simply raise the tariff on a, it was thousands, tens of thousands of materials that are imported in the United States, something like 25,000 various items. Whoa, and, and, it's, and it's a big raise. It's like going from 39% uh, tariff to over 60% almost doubling it. Can we say the Holly Smoot tariff, and just since many of us are Utahns, uh, the Smoot in the Holly Smoot tariff was Reed Smoot, the esteemed senator from Utah. Any event, this tariff goes in, goes through Congress. Economists came to Herbert Hoover, the president of the United States, says, veto it, veto it's a bad idea. You're going to have a big, big problem. It's going to hurt the world economy. And he signed it into law anyway. So it takes effect in 1930. In raising the tariffs so much, the biggest economic player in the world is now taken out of the world economy. You really can't trade with the United States anymore. We get a very challenging scenario when you end up with a trade war. A trade war is essentially this. You raise tariffs against me, I'll raise tariffs against you. That's a trade war. Even before the various governments in Europe and the world react and raise their tariffs to punish the United States for punishing them, we have people like in Switzerland saying, well, we were selling watches to the United States. With this tariff, we will no longer be able to sell watches. This is going to hurt our economy. Even before the Swiss government reacts, the Swiss people are saying to each other, we need to boycott, in other words, not buy American goods. Um, this leads to some very strong problems. Now, maybe I'm overstating stating this. It's more complicated than just one tariff. But we can say this is a major factor in destroying the world economy. <clears throat> Almost like a house of cards. Austria said, we can't keep going. We need loans. They appeal to the neighbors like Germany. We need loans to keep our economy afloat. The Germans say, we're hurting for money too. <clears throat> and so when the economy, the National Bank of Austria collapses, it's like a house of cards. It brings down other nations with it as well. So this economic, severe economic problem in the United States does impact other places. So this becomes a worldwide economic depression. Can we say of the, of the countries of the world, Germany is the hardest hit? Um, why would that be? The unemployment rate in the United States never went over 25%. Maybe for a brief period of time, went to 27%. Uh, that can be pretty harsh. Utah, being a poor state at that time, hit an unemployment rate of roughly 33%. Uh, which was very, very high. Um, however, Germany being highly industrialized, and when you have these tariffs go in to effect against manufactured items, Germany becomes perhaps the hardest hit of all the economies in the world. At one point, their unemployment rate actually goes up to 43%. What is not represented in this is that how many people that are technically still employed that have had their hours and wages cut to the point where they're having a hard time surviving. So complete unemployment is very hard, but having your wages cut can be very bad as well. <clears throat> Germany in 
Germany is a welfare state. It essentially leads out with certain things like old age pensions. It leads out, in other words, it's among the first, to give sick leave. And uh, there is a laws in effect in Germany that if you are hungry, the state will come forward and give you enough money to survive on. Well, in theory, it works this way, but in practice, it's somewhat different. Because what happens is this. People come to the government and say, look, uh, I'm unemployed. I, I need your help. And the government comes back and says, well, how far are your resources like? Uh, do you have anything in the bank? Uh, we want to look at your statements. We want to look at your other resources. And the government finds many ways of denying or delaying these people the kind of food they need, the kind of money they need uh, to buy food. Even if you are getting state handouts, one comedian said at one point, well, the amount of food you can buy for that is so low that in effect, it would probably take you maybe three years to actually starve to death. Be that as it may, Germans are hungry. There are people that will argue that history does not, does not teach lessons. Uh, I'm not among them. I mean, if you're talking about narrow political ideas that history teaches us, that uh, the party of Lincoln is the best party, or, or Lincoln would have supported this tariff after the Civil War. Those kind of things are very, very hard to argue. Can I say in a very broad sense, I do believe that history is largely an enormous morality play where you can see the kinds of things acted out over time, positive and negative. Let me hazard to say that there's an implied lesson involved here. One thing you need to do, and as you people in this class are going to be governors and senators, and you're going to be important people in government, make sure that your people are fed. Make sure your people are employed. Because you're going to have a lot less social and political problems if people feel good about their scenario. Germany hardest hit. Yeah. Uh, we have the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis are trying to keep the government from functioning well. Remember, remember, I already mentioned the Brown Search, the SA. They're disrupting government. They're disrupting meetings. They're disrupting press that disagrees with them. They are murdering rivals and uh, other political groups, including the communists, who are active this time frame. Uh, the SA gets their uh, fisticuffs out and they start beating people up. They are a major force in destabilizing the, the government. But one of the reasons why the government's destabilized is, in fact, economic problems. People are hungry, people are desperate, and people are taking desperate measures. <clears throat> we can say the Nazi vote uh, follows unemployment. You see, remember, before the stock market crash, for about five years, 1924 and 1929, the German economy is doing actually fairly well. Unemployment doesn't go down to super good levels. It's, you know, it's like 8%. But can we say that, that is, that's, that's actually, actually pretty good? Com uh, actually, comparing a few years later, when it ex explodes, literally up to 43%. We do not have opinion polls operating in Germany at this time frame. But we do have a pretty good idea of what people are thinking on the basis of, of elections. Uh, the, to us, it seems a little bit awkward. But there are times that there's elections in Germany, not just every couple of years, but every year, and sometimes every six months. Uh, they're act calling for new elections. So we can have a, a, a good indication as to the nature of people when they're supporting the, the Nazi government. And we find that as unemployment starts taking up, particularly in 1928, as, the, as unemployment, it's 1929, as unemployment starts going up, the Nazi vote starts going up as well. In 1928, the last full year before the Depression starts to have an influence, the Nazi vote in national, national election is less than 3%. I think the actual number is 2.8%. It's tempting to call that a joke. That's not very much. Goodness. If you had a political party in the United States getting 2.8%, you go, oh, who cares about them? What difference are they making? In other words, nobody cares about the Nazis. Nobody cares about Mein Kampf. 
Nobody cares about the kinds of things that Hitler's talking that you'd like to do. However, unemployment takes off and the Nazi vote goes up at the same time. So we have less than 3% in 1928, the last free election, the last time there was actually an election in Germany, in which, before the Nazis come to power, uh, in other words, we call the free election because the Nazis aren't intimidating people to vote for the Nazi party, the last free election, 33% of the vote cast in the national election in 1932 was for the Nazi party. Never was the Nazi party a majority party. Well, uh, a question is, of course, who is actually voting for them and why? Um, the centrist parties, the big parties in the middle, not really radical on either side, in many Germans' eyes, they failed the nation. Uh, sometimes they, they actually blame them for the, for the Treaty of Versailles. Sometimes they're actually blamed for the hyperinflation and, and the government's too weak to resist the French and Belgians when they invade in 1923. And uh, they tend to take the blame for this economic downturn. Remember, one of the reasons why Germany turns down economically is that the United States no longer has money to loan to Germany at extremely valuable, ext extremely advantageous rates. So at this point, we actually see that the, when some of the money coming in to help the German economy dries up, that hurts the German economy even more so. Well, so why are they voting for the Nazi party? Is it always that we're voting for something or are we voting against something? Let's make an interesting comparison because in November 1932, the United States has a general election. The two men running for the presidency of the United States is Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was the incumbent. He's the president coming back. He was inaugurated a president in March 1929, preaching prosperity to the nation. In October, what, seven months later, the economy of the, should say, the stock market collapses and the economy starts going down, down the tubes. He's blamed for this. Um, I think he deserves some of the blame, but I don't think he deserves all the blame. That doesn't really matter. The American people look upon him as the mechanism by which bad things happen. And he's also the person who has not solved the situation. When Roosevelt gets the nomination for his party, um, he's a little bit vague. He says, I'm going to fix the economy. Um, I'm but he doesn't really say what he's going to do. We have to wait, wait literally until he's elected president of the United States before we have a good idea of what he's doing. He's vague. You see, in reality, he thinks that if he says, comes out with definite programs, then he's subject to attack. And uh, people can disagree or agree with his ideas. But if he comes by and says, I'm not Hoover Hoover, he wins in a landslide. Is that the same kinds of things we're seeing in the Nazi party? Are they voting for the Nazis? Or are they looking at the Nazis as an alternative? And they're voting against the main political parties that are in control of the government. I, I think that could be a very big factor. Yes, we do see these things, Nazi rallies during, you know, uh, they're running for election. This happens on the 1930s. The people are out screaming and yelling, saying, well, the, the Hitler is popular. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But uh, let, let's make one thing completely clear. Oh, when the Nazi party gets one third of the election in 19, 1932, uh, going to war with Poland, invading the Soviet Union, butchering gypsies and Jews, is not on the ballot. If you're voting for the Nazi party, are you actually voting for just a change, somebody different? You're not voting to go to war. Have you ever had this experience? Whatever election is, you vote for candidate X, Y, Z, say, I like this person, I don't like whatever, and the various ways we make our decisions. And then we find out that the president for whom we voted did something that we don't actually agree with. That's very common, isn't it? This is the same kind of thing here. Well, how does Hitler actually get into power if he's not elected? Well, one third of the people 
in the Reichstag, the parliament, the Federal Assembly of Germany, uh, now have to be members of the Nazi party. Uh, as a bunch of big mouths, they can disrupt meetings. Uh, they can make things a little bit awkward. Yes, they can. Remember the brown shirts, the SA are still running around the streets, beating people up. And uh, the government now is very, very concerned because Germany seems like it's virtually on the edge, on the, on the verge, on the edge of a civil war. And how can they do something to quell this? And uh, Franz von Papen, one of the members of the German cabinet, comes up with the idea. Why don't we make Hitler chancellor? See, it's Hitler's brown shirts that are a big factor in making all this trouble. If we invite him in, he's an idiot. This, this guy has no education. He has no administrative experience. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He's just a big, big loudmouth. We can intimidate him. We can control him. And when you have him inside the government, then maybe he has a vested interest in keeping the peace. They vastly underestimated Hitler's abilities and his willingness to do unscrupulous things. Okay, so late in January, it was January 30th, something like that, 1933, <coughs> Hitler is made chancellor, the chief political person in the cabinet of Germany. Well, uh, now what? Okay, uh, quite frankly, it's a big one because Hitler now says, I've got control of the police. So he doesn't have to just use his brown shirts to beat up his political enemies. He can actually get the police to do it or the police to go out and, and, and disrupt a Communist Party rally, for example. Well, just a month later, February 1933, there's a fire in the Reichstag. This is the parliament building, their, their government building, like, like the U.S. Capitol building. There's a fire there. And uh, to this day, it's never been fully explained exactly what happened. But a man is arrested there, and he's somewhat mentally deficient. And uh, he had incendiary materials. In other words, he probably started the fire. What was his reasoning? Well, the guy is mentally challenged. That could be a reason enough. Um, but, uh, uh, and it has been theorized that maybe the Nazis were behind this and getting this guy to do it. Uh, that is clearly possible. I'm not sure that we've got enough good evidence to prove that. And uh, apparently when the information came to the Nazis, Hitler and the others, uh, about this, that in reality they were a little bit surprised. Be that as it may, Hitler now uses this as an excuse to declare virtually dictatorial powers. You see, now we can say, look, there's a rebellion involved. They're fighting against the government and attacking the Reichstag building, the parliament building. They are trying to bring down the government. We have to take extraordinary measures in this moment of fear. So he sends the police to move against his rivals. You can move and arrest the party bosses, the communist leaders that are running a, shall we say, a, comp a competing political organization. You can arrest people that you just don't like. You can arrest people in newspapers. You can arrest people in the police force that aren't supporting you well enough. And we do see the first concentration camp, Mauthausen, which is constructed outside of Munich, is actually created this time frame to take these political prisoners and stick them in an extremely challenging situation in which death rates are quite high. <clears throat> well, okay, now he's got control. He's moved against his enemies. In 1935 or 1934, he moves against people in his own party that he think might not be loyal enough to him. And in the Night of Long Knives, he kills hundreds of potential rivals there. So he's very much in control of his party. And he's very much in control of government. But can he actually govern? Well, Hitler comes forward and makes certain arguments like this. I'm going to recover. I'm going to rebuild Germany. People want jobs. They want good jobs. And uh, in economic recovery, well, let's put, put money in the economy. He says certain things like this. Um, this is a sector of the economy we're concerned about, unemployment rates, those kind of things. And uh, I'm going to uh, fix this. I'm going to make this better and give me a year or two, a certain length of time, uh, and it will improve. 
Hitler doesn't actually manipulate the economy by himself. I believe his name is Schacht, Helmut Schacht. It was the man that Hitler actually brought into government, say, as an economic minister, let's fix the economy. Well, one thing Hitler wants to do, of course, is to rebuild the German military. A lot of money involved. You pump, pump money into tanks. You pump money, pump money into aircraft. You pump, pump money into machine guns, artillery. And in that segment of the economy, you can see an awful lot of <clears throat> people being hired to produce these things. Now, I'm not an economist, but let me take a stab, a stab at this. If you produce a tank, the real value of that tank, of course, is defense. But what that tank can do is fire your enemies, for example. If you use that same amount of money, and a tank is a lot more expensive than a truck, if you put that money into the truck, the truck can move goods and services for you and build up other segments of the economy. Except for the people actually being hired to build the tanks, this doesn't help as much as people that are in in something like trucks, which can help the economy, I think, on a broader basis. Something else you can do for the economy is start taking large numbers of men into the military. Draft hundreds of thousands of men. Well, they're employed at that time frame. And uh, once again, they're not being productive, except as potential combatants. But you do have, they, they are being paid. And you have to hire people to make their boots and their uniforms. Uh, internal improvements. Uh, let's have better apartment buildings. Uh, one of the more famous things he did is built the famous Autobahn. The Autobahn is uh, essentially a German word for freeways. If you want an idea of what the original Autobahns were like, of course you can go to Germany, they still exist. Uh, another reason why you can do this is go to California. Now the interstate is a little early for the interstate system. <clears throat> but for when the when the people in, in California are building the brilliant, brilliant freeway system in California, they look to a model in Nazi Germany. Well, why is this a big deal to the Nazis? If you want to move around to face your enemies, you can use the rail network. Germany has a very good rail network. But how about a good highway system where you can move trucks, troops, transportation to and from the various borders of Germany, which helps in a very great deal as far as your ability to fight against your enemies? You see, you're not building an autobahn for Germans, because the Germans don't own cars. They do now. Uh, but you're employing people. Obviously, there's machinery involved and, and pick and shovel with the concrete the guys are shoveling. But once again, this will improve transportation in Germany, but it will also hire people. <clears throat> um, consumer goods, yes. Hitler believes he can buy the German people. So not just all military ramifications, but also consumer goods. Let me just bounce back a little bit. I mentioned the freeway system in California, which is pretty crowded every time I've been down there. My goodness. And in the LA area, you almost can't get around on weekends because it's just so many cars. <clears throat> in any event, in the 1950s, the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, pushed for the inner, the interstate system. We have freeways going all over the United States. And uh, as you know, before Eisenhower became president of the United States, he was a general. And obviously you can, and Americans do own cars, but you can move goods and services and Americans around so much easier using the interstates. Uh, on the other hand, it has a great strategic value. Because if we did get into a war with the Russians, I'm very glad to say we did not, but now you now have the interstate system where you can move your material around where you need to have it. Um, one other thing i got to say uh, about the interstates, the Autobahn, the freeway system in Germany, I think the reason was to get me killed. There was a couple of times I've been in Europe, a couple of times I've been in Germany, where I rented a car. I'm not going to rent a big, high-performance vehicle. I'm going to rent a relatively small vehicle that gets better gas mileage. 
And going out on the interstate is to take your life in your own hands. My goodness. I remember one time I had a little Opal. I think that's a Buick that the uh, uh, General Motors actually makes in Europe. I don't know if you can buy them in the United States or not. I don't think so. Any event, uh, <clears throat> I'm a hazard. Uh, and I'm going like 130 kilometers an hour. What's that, 80 miles an hour? It got so bad at one point, the engine light came on. I said, well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pull over or I'm going to blow that engine. And uh, yeah, I did pull over and wait a while. And it cools down. And I was able to drive a little more carefully, a little bit more slowly the next time. But I'm going down the, going down the freeway, uh, scared as I can be. White knuckle time, and then the Mercedes. I guess the Mercedes. A blur goes. Uh, there, there, are, there are no um, speed limits. The freeways, at least there weren't at that time. Of course, when these Mercedes goes off, they can have pretty spectacular accidents. Um, I shouldn't take this person. They didn't build the freeways just to kill me. But if you do rent a car in Germany, be very, very careful. Yes, they do have speed limits in Switzerland. It's a hundred kilometers an hour, sixty-two miles an hour. In France, I believe it's 130. Um, any of it. Um, they have freeways there as well. Okay. Does this actually work? Yes, it does. In fact, by 1938, Germany has got to the point where it actually exceeds full employment. Let's tell you, let me tell you what I mean by that. There are jobs in Germany that are available, but they don't have people enough of a workforce to take them. In some sectors, they are forced to hire women, which they didn't hardly ever do. Uh, they're forced to hire women to take man to take jobs that men would normally take. So that's a very, very high success as far as employment is concerned. Uh, in a very odd circumstance, in 1935, Hitler actually allowed a secret ballot to be uh, handed to workers. And remember, Hitler's been everything he could to court the workers, and I'm going to help your unemployment. And at that time frame, Hitler didn't even get, get a majority. It was 1935. Um, was that the same way three years later? Well, was Hitler popular? I believe he was. I believe he was popular. I believe his economy was very, people had responded to that. Yes, they'd given up a, a lot of their personal freedoms. People said order sometimes is a lot, is a lot better than being unemployed and being hungry. Yeah. Here we have representation of the Autobahn. And uh, I actually I remember it a little bit better than this, watching these streaks go by. So you can see multi lanes. Of course, the freeways are bigger now than they were then. Uh, a small irony of this when the United States invades Germany in 1945, one of the reasons why the United States was able to overthrow the state once they got in very rapidly is they get the U.S. trucks on the autobahns and the tanks, and they can move very rapidly. I haven't answered my question. Was he popular? Yes, I think he was. I think people are willing to give a lot of their personal freedoms simply with the understanding that they are going to live better, better food, and better lifestyle. Now, let's make a comparison. Germany went hardest into the Great Depression, and it came out the fastest and most completely. In 1938, when you've actually exceeded full employment in Germany, the United States economic indicators are bad. We're still in the Great Depression. Unemployment was at one point, as I mentioned, like 25%. It's down to about 18% this time frame. And all the in economic indicators are bad. In all likelihood, what's going to happen next is the econ U.S. economy is going to go back down again. Yeah, there's money put in the U.S. economy, but it's a little bit like taking your wallet from your pocket and you take it out and here's the money. Ta -da, here's the money and you take it like this, and watch it very carefully, goes over to the other hand and you put it in the other pocket. What have you accomplished? Not really much of anything. And that's what the United States is doing. 
the economists had come to the uh, President of the United States, Roosevelt, said, let's just bend our way out of this. And the President of the United States, Roosevelt, says, well, I want to stimulate the economy and balance the budget. That's hard to do. It's hard to spend money and have enough money to keep the, the, the economy balanced. So as the United States limps deal into the Great Depression, the way you get out is spend money. Economic downturn, spend money. You might have to deal with inflation if you spend too much or too fast. But this is no secret. And Germany spends its way out. Okay. Hitler was popular, yes. But once again, I cannot argue that even though he was popular, that he, had, he, had, he was able to keep the economy strong or make the economy strong. That the German people are really not in a big, big desire and I'm being facetious in saying that. They don't want to go to war. For many years, I had this, this problem in understanding World War I and World War II. How could it be these men who were in the trenches during the First World War, late teens, early 20s, big percentages of them, how 21 years after the ending of the First World War, could you actually have a Second World War? Do you think these guys have forgotten? Now, remember, late teens, early 20s in 1918. 21 years later, you're late 30s, 39 or whatever, or early 40s. Guess what? You're going to have to do it again. Yeah, you were private in 1918. You might be a sergeant in 1939. But you know what it's like. And you're going to do it again. Do you want to go through that again? Simple answer is no, you do not. It's a horrible experience. So... Why didn't they stop it? Well, they didn't stop it because this is not a democracy. There's not a vote to go to war. We have a dictatorship, which is forcing a nation to go to war and trying to drag a, na a reluctant nation into combat. Okay. Well, all right. Hitler starts to, to uh, waggle his sword in front of people. He's trying to get as much as he can with the least amount of cost. In other words, let's get what I can before I'm going to war. Um, let's look at Germany in the 1930s. Uh, maybe that's not the best place to be. Let's try it anyway. Well, thank you very much. Um, and here we have a map of downtown Provo again. Well, okay, let's look at this one. Uh, Germany, according to the Treaty of Versailles, cannot have combat troops over here. Uh, all you can have is a police force. In 1935, Hitler sends his army into the Rhine in this area over here. Not well trained, not well outfitted, and not very many of them. Had France, with a very large and very good army, had decided to move in this time frame, they could have destroyed Adolf Hitler right on the spot. But France got burned so badly in this invasion in 1923, they do not react. And in 1938, Hitler decides that he wants to bring in these German-speaking people down here. We call them Austrians. And... Uh, some people thought that maybe Austria should have been part of Germany in the first place. Of course, France would not allow that at the end of the First World War. And the Anschluss, the unification, Hitler actually intimidates the Austrians into saying that, into allowing Germany to come in and take them over. Uh, though Germany had done very, very well economically by 1938, Austria had not. So one of these nations was unable to spend its way out of its situation. And uh, when Hitler comes in, we do see crowds in Vienna screaming and yelling, yes, love you, love you, and the Nazi salute, and all these kind of things. Well, are they really saying, I know they're saying Hitler and Nazis and welcome Germany, but can we say they're saying jobs, jobs, jobs? Um, poor Austria, the people anyway, join with the Germans 
relatively readily uh, to get economic advantages. And unfortunately, just a year or two later, they get dragged into a war, which is devastating for them. Well, Hitler is, is doing things a lot of people are quite concerned about. And uh, Hitler doesn't want the major powers, Britain, France, Russia, for example, into bothering him in what he's doing. And he looks around, he, he says, um, I need to get all German-speaking people in, in the Reich, in his empire. And there are what we call the Sudeten Germans, you see it right here, which are in Czechoslovakia. And uh, 3.5 million, maybe 4 million Germans live there, German-speaking people. Um, Hitler makes up a story that, in reality, that <clears throat> um, these people are being abused. Well, they may not treat as nice as they want to be, but in no real sense is the Czech government brutalizing them. Uh, can we say, therefore, that Hitler's kind of making up his cause? That's true to a certain extent. And uh, he says, I'm going to go to war. These people have to be back in Germany. They have to be part of, of the Reich, part of his empire. And, uh, of course, the Czechs can't defeat Germany. That's not going to happen. So there's a meeting in Munich between Didier of France. Neville Chamberlain is the prime minister of Great Britain. What they're trying to do is what we call appeasement. Remember the First World War. Let's go back a ways. These people remember the First World War very well. What happens at the beginning of the First World War? And remember, we have nations uh, declaring war on each other rather than looking at what their best interests are and the other people's best interests. Like a house of cards, it simply collapses and you have a number of nations jumping into war very rapidly. What would happen if they hadn't done that? What would happen if they had actually had a good negotiation? You see, what if you could give nations what they wanted, they wouldn't go to war? We call this appeasement. In 1936, the British government said, look, let's buy this guy off. How about colonies in Africa? We got colonies in Africa. Just tell him, ask him if he wants colonies in Africa. Hitler doesn't want colonies in Africa. He can't be bought in that regard. But Hitler says, look, you give me the Sudetenland. If you don't, I'll go to war. Ooh, war people are afraid of war. If you don't, I'll go to war. And, of course, we've got another world war going on because other nations become quite rapidly involved. Or you can simply give it to me. Well, Chamberlain flies down to Munich. They have this big discussion with Hitler. And uh, Hitler didn't like them very much. He called them worms because they didn't have any backbone. Essentially what France and Britain do at this time, they say, look, you want it take it. We will not bother you, but this is your last territorial demand. And they says, yes, this is my last territorial demand. So they literally turn their back as Hitler moves into this area. This is late 1938. Now Hitler says, well, they didn't care about the German-speaking people in the Czech Republic. Let's take the rest of it. So March 1939, he simply goes in and takes the remainder of the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia up here. It's not part of the agreement. Okay, let's go back to the idea of appeasement. We know in retrospect this was a bad idea. We know in retrospect, quite frankly, this was a very bad idea because it didn't work. Can we say it's about the Allies' time? Yes, it did, but on on the one hand. On the other hand, they're not really arming rapidly enough that it made that much of a difference. As stupid as this seems to us, in reality, it might have been worth trying. If it had worked, we could have saved an enormous number of lives. It didn't work, we know that. We all know that in retrospect. Let's jump ahead to the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War was back to the idea of 1914. In fact, more than once, the United States, NATO, America, and their allies drew what I would call a line in the sand. For example, during the Berlin crisis of 1961, where the Russians decided to 
keep people from East Berlin going to West Berlin. The President Kennedy said, these are our strategic interests. And unfortunately, Berlin was not one of them. At least East Berlin was not one of them. And he said that if you cross these, these borders uh, or you threaten these areas, we will go to war. So we're back to the idea of threat. Now, obviously, there was not a World War III, so certain, to a certain extent, it worked. In reality, however, uh, I, we wouldn't know at that time, it's better to try to buy the Russians off or to try to appease them. In, in any event, Hitler took the rest of Czechoslovakia in 1939, invaded Poland, thinking perhaps the Allies would not react, though France and Britain said, you invade Poland, we'll go to war. Say, you won't do it. But they did. So on September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and now we have the Second World War, which we will discuss next time. In the meantime, have a great day.